All right, without further ado, I am going to get started. So welcome again, uh, the Wyoming Outdoor Council, Citizens for the Red Desert and all of our partners acknowledge that the Red Desert is an ancestral landscape and a living cultural corridor. We also acknowledge that public land such as the Red Desert exists because people who first lived there were forcefully removed and this land was taken from them. Since time immemorial, tribes including the Shoshone, Ute, Goshu, Paiute, Bannock, Arapaho, Cheyenne, Lakota, and Crow have lived, hunted, and prospered in these places. And Citizens for the Red Desert is including tribal members and leaders in every level of our decision making and in our campaign for protection of this landscape. And we welcome all of you to join us in this journey and to really begin to think about um, what rematriation and reciprocity looks like for indigenous sovereign nations. Um, what, what do we want to ensure or how do we ensure that their traditional and contemporary culture and sacred spaces flourish now and into the future? I will now introduce our panelists. Our first speaker is Yufna Soldier Wolf. She was born and raised on the Wind River Reservation. Her name actually means Mother Nature's Child. She is a citizen of the Northern Arapaho and has Cheyenne and Lakota ancestry. Her heart and passion is for preservation of tribal ways and customs, which inclu includes protecting the land um, of her ancestors. She's received various degrees um, from Montana State University and the University of Wyoming. And while she works for the Wyoming Outdoor Council, she's actually pursuing a master's at Montana State University in Indigenous Studies with a specialization in sovereignty. Uh, Yufna has a wealth of experience working um, for over a decade with the Northern Arapaho Historic Preservation Office and has 15 years experience um, working with the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act. We are lucky to have her aboard and thank you for speaking with us today, Yufna. Jason Baldez is our second panelist. Uh, he is an enrolled member of the Eastern Shoshone tribe and has received both his bachelor's and master's degrees in land resources and environmental sciences from Montana State University, where he focused on the reintroduction of Buffalo to tribal lands. In 2016, he spearheaded the successful effort to relocate a herd to the Wind River Reservation, a project that took decades in the making. He's an advocate, educator, and speaker on indigenous cultural revitalization and ecological restoration. He served as a, a director for the Wind River Native Advocacy Center where he was instrumental in passing the Wyoming Indian Education Act for All. And he is currently serves as the Tribal Buffalo Coordinator for the National Wildlife Federation of Tribal Lands Partnership Program and is on the board of the Conservation Lands Foundation and the Wind River Foundation. Our final panelist is Wes Martell. He's a member of the Eastern Shoshone Tribe and was on the Eastern Shoshone Business Council for 20 years. During his tenure, he focused on water, taxation, energy, and the environment. And he served on commissions that were responsible for developing, drafting, and approving a severance tax code and the Wind River Water Code. Mr. Martell um, has also served as the chairman of the Fish and Game Committee, which developed fisheries and wildlife management plans in conjunction with the US Fish and Wildlife Service, which resulted in the tribal hunting code being enacted. Mr. Martell is also a veteran and has a deep and abiding respect for the values and beliefs of indigenous people. And he is right now currently applying his skills for the Greater Yellowstone Coalition as a senior Wind River Conservation Associate. Thank you, Wes, Jason, and Yufna again for being here. Uh, without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Yufna and um, take it from there, Yufna. Um, can you see my, my screen, Shalise? Yes, we can see your screen and I can hear you perfectly. Great, thank you. 
So to spesi nete ina nananana yufna soldrowaf. I am the Wyoming Outdoor Council Wind River organizer, and thank you all for coming out today. Um, so when uh, just backing up a little bit, kind of talking about um, what the Red Desert means to us was something of importance and really vital to protecting, preserving, and conserving this beautiful land. One of the things that we're working towards with the citizens for the Red Desert and Run the Red is to be able to bring out those indigenous narratives of the Red Desert. And um, this is one thing that we brought upon was what something we can do to promote that. And I, I really am glad that um, we're moving forward and looking at the indigenous narratives of the Red Desert. It's something that has been left out for too long. And I think it's important that we don't lose these stories. Um, one of my, my um, ideas for the presentation was what, what do I want to share and how much of that do I want to share? So um, with this, um, I wanted to kind of go forward and talk about um, the Arapaho history. A lot of the history I know of is history passed down to me from my, my father, Mark Soldierwolf. Um, I remember times going out to the Red Desert with my father when we were just kids, he'd always take us somewhere, somewhere we we're always going somewhere as little kids. Um, so with that, oh, I cannot. Okay, and so I kind of wanted to hit real lightly touch upon the treaties of the Arapaho um, and kind of bring up forward to um, an overall summary of the Arapaho and how we look at the Red Desert and what it's utilized for. So we all know basically some of the history and that we are kind of um, newcomers to um, the Eastern Shoshone Reservation. Um, and that history that had brought us to that pinnacle point of actually coming to the Eastern Shoshone Reservation, which later became the Wind River Reservation. So in 1851, the Fort Laramie Treaty, um, which would later again happen in 1868, um, and a lot of that was because of the Sand Creek Massacre, which happened in Colorado. So there's things happening in our nation uh, further from here that impacted the Arapaho. And slowly we had the Red Clouds War in 1866, which later led to the 1868 Fort Laramie Treaty, which later on, um, we just, the Arapahoes were in the Arapaho Thunder Basin area um, here in Wyoming. Um, so that's 1870, 71 and 1875 Red Cloud um, Agency. We, the Rappos were took it to um, basically Pine Ridge and we were always known as possibly, we were always a mixture of the, the, the Sioux Lakota um, tribes. Um, these pictures here, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor, but right here, I don't know if you guys can see my cursor here. This is my great grandfather, Sharp Nose. And um, in 1877, the Arapahoes, and it's, if you Google this, it'll mostly say the, the Sioux delegates of 1877. Well, a lot of the, those same delegates were Arapaho delegates. Um, and as you can see at the bottom of this historical picture of 1877, when they did go to DC under, um, I believe it was um, President Hayes. Um, so you can see Black Coal here, uh, Friday, Sharp Nose. And in the Sioux delegates, there's Red Bear and Touch the Cloud. Um, they say Red Bear is Sharp Nose's father and Touch the Cloud was his uncle. Um, through Red Bear and Touch the Clouds, they were um, basically brothers. So within these um, delegates, they went to DC asking the president to please give us a place to go. You know, we don't wanna go to Red Cloud Agency in um, Pine Ridge. We wanna have our own unique place to go. And so it was, you know, um, decided that we would come here with the Eastern Shoshone temporarily and 150 some years later we're still here you know looking for a reservation. Um, so a lot of this history plays up into the, the fact that we were um, using and utilizing these areas but more more so not more so than the East, Eastern Shoshone, Shoshone Bannock, the U, U Mountain U, all of those tribes were predominantly in the Red Desert. Um, the Red Desert, as we know, is really vital to the tribes, all tribes. Um, we use that, a lot of the knowledge, um, that, that of which we call traditional ecological knowledge. And these places weren't just used because of no reason. A lot of them were used because of the plants, the animal corridors, the water, the star knowledge. Um, there are times when we've gone to different places and um, I, we've take, taken different tribes or elders out 
and they just see the vast, vast resources that are out there. And our, our idea of resources is basically nature, um, like the plants, animals, water, and star knowledge. There's so much that I could go into about <laughs> sites and traditional ecological knowledge. But for the Red Desert, that's what we're kind of going and that's what we want to promote is that those indigenous narratives to why these areas are important. So the history of the Arapaho and the Cheyenne, the lady here in the left is my great grandma and her name is Prinos. And um, previously, the previous series that Todd Gunther had talked about was this history about Pretty Nose. Well, um, just to reiterate that history, um, Pretty Nose was um, married to Seminole Lysanis, and um, she, he was a French trader. And what he did was he went around and he traded for beaver pelts, whatnot, um, a lot, you know, a long time ago. And so she knew of these routes, but these routes which later on would become um, Indian trails or historic trails were basically made from the buffalo. The buffalo were really important, not just for resources, but to make a path in ways that they would travel. And so today we know this, this, this cut across name as um, Seminole cut across or cut off. And that too is in the red desert. Um, kind of going into it a little bit more, um, this historic trail is 1840 to the 1900s, and the purple um, line here is from the ice loft, like where bare oil is, and into um, Atlantic City and the Red Desert. A lot of these areas right now, um, and a lot of that history, we're losing as, um, as a tribe because they're not promoted and we don't talk about them. Um, and that's something we need to continuously do and give that narrative, give that indigenous narrative to these areas. Um, so that's one history and I could go so, so much more into it, but I have some more things I would like to share. And um, my, my father had shared with me, you know, we talked about um, outlaws, you know, Indian outlaws. And um, one of the stories he shared with me was about Butch Cassidy and Blue Duck, who was later known as AKA Scabbard. Um, and if you do look in the historic photos, just like the Sioux delegates, um, they do call Scabbard Ogallala Sioux. And so a long time ago, um, we were so intertwined, intermixed. Um, the photos are good, good, um, um, good signs of that, basically. So one of the things I did want to share was some of the history, and there's so much more history that goes into this. Basically, um, the story that I was told was that um, Blue Duck would hide out with the outlaws, and he, he was kind of the navigator through all of these various places. And my, doc, my dad talked about the outlaw triangle, which was the whole back to hole in the wall, to um, Belfouche, to the Black Hills, to Deadwood, um, you know, back down to the Red Desert, back down to Robert's Roost, but all the way back down to the birdcage in Arizona. So these areas were well traversed by a lot of the Native Americans. And it just so happens that one of our relatives is Blue Duck. Um, Blue Duck's relation to me would be, he was Sharp Nose's little brother. And one of the stories was Blue Duck was um, basically died in 1889. Um, he was caught by the sheriffs in um, Deadwood, Belfouche, and he jumped out of the hotel room with the sheriff. And when they, upon hitting the floor, the ground, um, he, he died, um, but they did catch him. And one of the stories was that he was with um, Cattle Kate. And so the dates of 1889 and his death kind of correlate. There's so much that goes into this also, but there's so much history that can be talked about with the Red Desert and all of these other areas that are really important in Wyoming. Um, and then one of the other ones is the desert dust. We all know Frank Robbins had um, basically found this, um, this Mustang horse. And we talked about this and one of the stories that my dad had talked about was that, um, you know, it was said that around Crook Mountain where they have their current um, horse management area was possibly the area where um, this horse was found. Um, and this um, Crook Mountain is around where Bear Oil Ice Sloth is in that same area. And so the story is that there were um, Shoshone and Arapaho men that went out there and showed him, hey, you know, there's some areas out here you might find a good horse. Um, we all know it was really controversial with Desert Dust, um, but they did make a movie out of this. 
um, and Desert Dust, basically it's a TCM movie. And um, it was made back in 1927. And I have been trying to look for it. I wouldn't mind seeing the full film. Um, and that's something really important to, I think, all tribes and maybe even the, the state of Wyoming to, um, you know, basically preserve these areas. Um, we want to be able to conserve these areas for the future and be able to tell these stories more thoroughly. And then lastly, one of the Arapaho histories that I do have is my grandpa Sharpnose um, and his wife Sweetgrass, who did go travel through the Red Desert continuously. And one of the stories we have, and it's a long story, but to keep it short and summarize, um, the story is that Sharpnose had traveled through here, possibly through um, White Mountains petroglyph site. And those areas um, we have stories about, but he had said that, um, it is said that the name, the Three Stars General name is passed down. And um, this, the, the name Three Stars is a, a family name that's been passed down through many generations. Um, Grandpa Sharpnose's uncle, or Grandpa Sharpnose's son, Scott Dewey had that name. Um, Scott Dewey turned around and gave the name to my uncle, Lloyd Dewey. Um, Lloyd then turned around and gave the name to my dad, who was his brother. And then my dad turned around and gave it to my nephew. So that, that name has just passed, been passed down through generations. And um, it was said that that name was acquired at the Red Desert. So basically all of these histories, this knowledge needs to be preserved. It needs to be protected. We're so connected to the earth right now that I, I, I would really not like to see so much happening um, to the Red Desert. Um, there's so much knowledge that can be um, obtained there. And we're at that pinnacle point of, you know, it's now or never. Right now is the best time to be able to start pulling these indigenous narratives together and start telling that history and start sharing it. Um, I do wanna thank um, Citizens for the Red Desert. Run the Red is this September 25th. Um, Wyoming Outdoor Council for sponsoring this and Shalice, I believe that is it. Um, I just do wanna thank everybody. If you want to get a hold of me, there's my email at the bottom. Um, and I wanna say thank you. And um, I really look forward to the next panelist. Thank you, ho ho. Thank you, Yufna. And those of, uh, those of you that have joined and missed my introduction, we are going to be allowing um, the audience to put questions in the chat and I'll um, filter those to the panelists um, at the end. Our next panelist is Jason Baldez. Take it away, Jason. Oh, hoo -hoo. Thank you, uh, Shalice, for that uh, introduction and to say Zon Dive to each and every one of you out there. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Jason Baldus. Uh, I serve as the uh, Tribal Buffalo Program Manager for the National Wildlife Federation's Tribal Partnerships Program. And I'm glad to uh, be here with you today to talk about uh, Anga, Basa Sogo, the Red Desert. So we uh, Shoshone people have lived in this area uh, for a very long time, uh, contemporarily, uh, as well as historically, Shoshone people, just by archeological evidence, have been here for 13,000 years. We, we believe that that, of course, is, is much longer. Uh, our historic ties uh, to this place uh, go back for a millennia. And that is uh, something that often escapes the minds of, of people that our Shoshone people, the speakers of the Utah Aztecan dialect, uh, one of the northernmost peoples of that language group uh, have been here. And this particular photo was taken by at South Pass, uh, just the northern part of the, the Red Desert. Uh, during the time of uh, reservation era, our, our leadership, uh, the health and wealth of our communities was based upon a holistic relationship. Uh, the, the biodiversity of the plants and animals was where our wealth was prior to a money-based economy. And our leadership was divided uh, amongst individuals. Uh, Chief Washke often gets the, all of the credit, but there were 
there were uh, several other leaders uh, in amongst uh, the, the leadership that my great great grandpa, uh, my mother's side, Rabbit Tail, uh, was a scout. And, uh, you know, our people always encouraged uh, education. You know, at times we were allied with the Crow. And Chief Plenty Coup said that with education, we were the white man's equal. Without it, we were his victim. And so these individuals at that time recognized that in order to uh, fight the fight, to battle for our, our rights and responsibilities, that education would be key. And that is uh, the case even today. It's very important to understand the history of the United States and the founding of the, the 800 treaties, 40, 400 of them ratified by Congress, resulted in a, a drastic diminishment in the land ownership of tribes in the United States. And so that history is also synonymous with what happened to the buffalo, that you know, tribes and buffalo are now on remnants of our once former vast territories, tribes on reservations, buffalo uh, bison in parks and refuges and private ranches. So the, uh, we have to have a, a foundation in what eras of uh, federal Indian law and policy have led up to today. There's been six eras, coexistence, removal and reservations, assimilation and allotment, organization, termination and relocation, and self-determination. Uh, we are considered in an era of self-determination now, but almost an uh, era of uh, forced federalism, that tribal governments are supposed to be on par with the federal government, to be a government-to-government -government relationship. But more and more tribes are forced to negotiate and work with the states in which we're located. And this is uh, uh, what we're calling or terming uh, forced federalism. Self-determination is the movement by which Native Americans can achieve restoration. And self-determination of tribes today is very, very important in uh, making decisions for our future. We have to keep in mind that colonization and assimilation were always the goal. Uh, but today we have to be conscious of the, those types of thought processes that lead our land management and uh, resource management decisions and, uh, and policies. Uh, federal trust responsibility. This is by treaty, the, the obligation of the United States to tribes. Uh, where's uh, occasion after occasion of failure of the federal government's trust responsibility. This is why we are so uh, maybe uh, anxious of the confirmation of Deb Holland as the Secretary of Interior because we feel that finally there can be some recognition of, of this federal trust responsibility to tribes and the sovereignty of those tribes to be able to exercise our rights um, that are similar to states' rights and uh, ability to govern our own affairs. An example of uh, where the state is working, I think, in recognizing what, what you've going to refer to traditional ecological knowledge is, is our, our, our understanding of this place, this, our place names and our languages, and how important being able to speak and utilize languages uh, today is, is so important for our young people. But as states and agencies, uh, NGOs, others begin to acknowledge this land that we're all on and the tribes that were associated with those lands, then we can build that understanding mutual respect uh, about our understanding and histories for these, these places. Uh, let's not forget that in the Treaty of 1863, the reservation uh, included the, the, the res many portions of the Red Desert. Uh, these delineations were, were not uh, absolute in any way. They overlapped and they were uh, dynamic. But uh, in the Treaty of 1868, the, the United States Federal Agents and Commissioners recognized the Shoshone tribes, tribes utilized this vast territory for different resources. We weren't nomadic. Nomadic implies you don't know where you're going. We knew exactly where we were going at different times of the year for different resources, whether that be for buffalo, pronghorn antelope, or bighorn sheep, or sage grouse, or uh, whatever food source was necessary for us to acquire at that time. The desert contains many of these uh, plant species 
that are very important, medicinal uh, food sources uh, and tools. Um, even though we're uh, limited to the reservation boundaries that exist today, it doesn't diminish our, uh, our traditional cultural ties to our traditional territories and lands. Uh, we shouldn't be confined to only our reservation boundaries of, of today. Uh, again, that colonialistic and assimilative uh, processes that happen to our people. Uh, we today have, uh, through self-determination, uh, you know, rights to exercise beyond our boundaries. And as Wes mentioned uh, in his intro, uh, there's Supreme Court cases now that are upholding the federal trust responsibility, some of these legal uh, course cases that uh, were off reservation hunting for access to uh, traditional lands. Keep in mind also that many of the lands that are adjacent to the reservation now uh, are national forests, wilderness areas, and national parks. Well, that was all previous reservation. But when you look at maps of the greater Yellowstone ecosystem, oftentimes the reservation is excluded. And this is an example of the deep exclusion and minimization of sovereignty and the access of, of tribes to, uh, to these places. So if uh, to take you know, any of these points home, uh, you know, it's really that uh, we have to build these relationships, collaboration, recognize self-determination, sovereignty, and, the, and the, uh, the trust responsibility, not only of the federal government, but state agencies have to tribes. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I see that uh, those relationships are getting better. Uh, for instance, I, I, you know, I'm a bias, but, you know, the National Wildlife Federation has built a relation with uh, the tribes here at Wind River for decades. Uh, if you remember the Bighorn case, the longest running court case in the history of Wyoming about who controls water on this reservation of which the tribes lost because they were advocating for in-stream flow for fisheries. Well, the National Wildlife Federation had supported the legal battle for the tribes for that entire process. And so this is an example of where national NGOs can really uh, wholeheartedly and respectfully work with tribes and partnerships and genuine collaboration. And that has happened in the restoration of of bison or buffalo back to the reservation. Uh, there are many environmental justice issues that need to be addressed on this reservation and I'm very thankful for uh, Wyoming Outdoor Council, National Wildlife Federation, uh, Greater Yellowstone Coalition for recognizing the tribal voices that are needed in this day uh, in, in these types of conversations. And so I really wanna say who we who, uh, thank you to each and every one of you. Thank you to Shalice and Yufna and uh, Wes, I appreciate the opportunity to be able to visit with you all today. And I want to thank you for uh, this opportunity to, to share. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jason. We are a little bit ahead of schedule and there was a question in the chat box from Catherine Jenkins and she's She's asked if there has been any effort to add the indigenous names of places. Um, for example, the, the migration map that you showed to signage in the state that you know of. That's, an, that's a great question. I am unaware of uh, that level of uh, inclusion but I think that would be a great project for GYC or Wyoming Outdoor Council or even a, a tribally led effort here. Uh, you know, the, the Wind River Native Advocacy Center is a, another great nonprofit that exists on the reservation uh, that's working with uh, other entities to change some local uh, terminology uh, such as Jason, are you still there? He seems to have cut out a bit. Um, 
If people would turn off their video, it might help. Jason, can you hear me? I think Jason has um, disconnected momentarily. Uh, for now, um, let's, I'll pass it to Wes. And again, if folks have questions, continue to uh, populate the, the chat box with any questions that you have. And our third and final uh, panelist is Wes Martell. And Wes, we are ahead of schedule. And I know that you like to talk. So maybe this is a perfect opportunity for you to get warmed up in the first 15 minutes and um, speak to us. So take it away, Wes. Thank you, Shalias. And uh, I'd like to thank the citizens of the Red Desert and the Wyoming Outdoor Council for this gathering. I think it's uh, very timely. And I think that, uh, you know, all of the issues that are going on around us nationally really require us to start looking at uh, conservation issues and, you know, some of the so-called public lands out there and you know how we manage those for the benefit of the coming generations. Uh, right now, um, I'm working with the Greater Yellowstone Coalition as the Wind River Se Senior Wind River Conservation Associate. And uh, when I seen this position advertised and I looked at the mission of the GYC, you know, the mission of the GYC is to protect the lands, waters, and lands, waters, and wildlife of the Great Yellowstone ecosystem. And Wind River Reservation, we're part of that ecosystem. The northwest corner of our reservation is 42 miles from the southeast corner of Yellowstone National Park. And that south southeast corridor down from the park on the Buffalo traditional migratory path used to come right through our reservation or up in the northwest corner. Crow Creek and the East Fork country. So we're very connected to the, to the ecosystem and to all the good things that the park and other public lands provide for us. You know, while I was listening to uh, Jason and you, and I was thinking about one time, um, we had some friends back East and they were traveling out this way and they came up here to uh, the, the Rez area. And uh, my friend was saying, you know, I said, driving up this way, he said, boy, he said, what? And he, he's from why he's from he's from back in New England country, so a lot of trees and forests and other things. And he said, "Boy, Wyoming is pretty barren." And I didn't say nothing, but I was just thinking, "Hey, if you just knew all the plants and foods and medicines and good things that are out there, you'd have a whole different perspective on how barren Wyoming is." And so, you know, that's really the connection that we have that we bring to this because. Within um, you know, a lot of organizations and tribes, and, and you know, we talk about land acknowledgement. And for most, most of the people out there in America, land acknowledgement to them means ownership. Oh, I own that land, that belongs to me. As indigenous people, the land, we belong to the land. The land does not belong to us. And when we acknowledge the land, you know, we'll go out there and, and touch it and watch it and feel it. And sometimes we even taste it to dip our finger in and take a little taste of our mouth because that earth and that dirt is what heals us. That earth and that dirt is what provides our protection against all the things that are out there. And so that's really an indigenous viewpoint that has to be brought back. And, you know, just like Jason and you have to have mentioned, um, if it wasn't for the removal of Indians, there would be no public lands. And all the public lands laws adopted by Congress over the decades pretty much exclude us and ignore us. And there's still out areas out there where we go to get those plants and medicines that heal us 
and nourish us and protect us. That's a feeling that most people don't have. And so, you know, as, as in my position as the Wind River Conservation Associate for the Greater Yellowstone Coalition, that's part of my duty, I believe, is to help restore that. And how do we bring that back? And of course, we've got to focus right here on our own reservation, Wind River. We're the same size as Yellowstone National Park. Pretty much the same terrain, country, water. We have all the same things that the park has. Grizzlies, wolves, mountain lion, buffalo, moose, bighorn sheep. We have all that here right on, on our reservation. We're pretty lucky to be from this part of the world. We have a 138,000 acre roadless area up in the west central part of our reservation. The only reservation in the country that has a roadless area. And that was approved back in the 1930s, 1932, I believe. So almost a hundred years ago, our elders were thinking about how important it is to protect what we have, this ecosystem our relatives, the plants, the birds, the trees, the winged ones, the, the water creatures, all above ground, all below ground, we're all connected. And so that really uh, is important, not only protection from a conservation point of view, but the plants and the foods and the medicines that are out there are still part of us. We still need those plants and foods and medicines. Like I mentioned, those things that protect, heal and nourish. And so that's part of this overall effort, I think, because we really need to get back to the ways that our ancestors saved for us. You know, through these past several decades, we're always getting attacked. Somebody's always attacking our sovereignty or our rights or our boundaries to our reservations in this day and age. You know, just about three or four years ago, we were trying to adopt a Clean Air Act here on the reservation and Wyoming challenged us on that and said we didn't have authority over boundaries of our reservation. Here we are in 20, you know, 20th, 21st century, and we're still getting those kind of racist attacks against our treaties and our sovereignty and our land. What little we have left, we're still trying to get it. And so that's why our knowledge and our place on this earth is so critical. One of our, our, our Shoshone elders have started a, Restoring Shoshone Ancestral Foods Gathering. And a lot of the plants and foods and medicine out there are bring, being recognized and identified and gathered and processed and prepared. And so our, some of our elders are trying to get back to our ancestral foods. Before the white man came, Shoshones never got sick because of their lifestyle and their diet. And so the, this Restoring Shoshone Ancestral Foods Gathering is trying to bring some of that back. And they're going about it the right way. They're, 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 uh, there's a few tribal members now that are switching over to some of these foods. And so they're doing you know, uh, blood pressure and sugar level readings and other things like that to kind of acquire some data and some baseline information on restoring Shoshone ancestral foods. I was, uh, during some of my work with the GYC, I, I uh, talking with an, an old park service employee. He mentioned that back in the 1970s, there was a, a grizzly bear task force uh, that was established to start looking at uh, the park and all of the forage and habitat and plants and foods of the grizzlies and their, their, their uh, habitat. And um, that's really important for us because the, the plants and the foods and the berries that the grizzlies love 
indigenous people love those same foods. And so that's really critical of how we look at these public lands and try to restore indigenous voices in those public lands. So this Restoring Shoshone Ancestral Foods Program, you know, kind of has other objectives to it. You know, we're trying to find out the health of our ancestral foods, but that's also critical information that has to be saved and transferred from the elders to our young people. And so again, you know, how do we develop the curriculum? How do we find the time in our schools to be able to teach cultural, traditional, indigenous knowledge? That is getting more and more hard to, to, to find and to recover. So that's really an important area that uh, is really supported by a program created by the Park Service. Every tribe has a tribal historic preservation officer. And it's these officers that, uh, you know, number one, try to retain the cultural and traditional heritage of the tribes. They have to deal with all these federal agencies that are working on and off reservation on archaeological and cultural resources. They try to have to keep track of what's going on with language programs and, you know, retention of elders and bringing them into the connection with, 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 with our young people. And so that's really uh, an important area that we all have to focus on as a tribal historic preservation officers of every tribe. And part of this whole government to government relationship that we have in our tribes, we have a unique political and legal relationship with, tri with, with federal government. And this legal political relationship gives tribes the opportunity to do things that other governments cannot do. For instance, on the environmental side, tribes can adopt higher standards for water quality and air quality than the federal government. And that's another area where, where governance has to come in. And one of the, you know, my, in, in my introduction, uh, Sheree has talked about, I was involved with developing the Wind River Water Cool. And when I first, got assigned to the Wind River Environmental Quality Commission and our task was to develop the Wind River water code. I about fell out of my chair. I thought I needed a battery of attorneys and consultants and engineers and federal representatives and a whole army of people to help me learn how to put together a water code. And I was really fortunate. I was able to uh, connect with a an old friend of mine that worked in California that worked on tribal justice and tribal court training programs. And so I told him I needed some help on developing a tribal water cool. And a couple of weeks later, he called me back and he said, Wes, I've got a team prepared to come up to help you with your tribal water cool. So he sent up five people. He sent up two attorneys. One attorney was Dr. Charles Wilkinson at the University of Colorado at Boulder, respected man in federal Indian law and federal water rights and tribal sovereignty issues. The other attorney was Dr. David Getches. He was the original founder of the Native Americans Rights Fund before John Echohawk took over as director. But David was a um, another expert on federal Indian law and water rights. He was also the Colorado State Water Engineer for about 10 years. So he really knew water law and the various components of that. Then we had two economists, an agricultural economist and an energy, econ energy and, and recreation economist because Wind River, we're just a, a smaller version of Wyoming. Our economy dependent on oil and gas, right? Agriculture and livestock. In government sector jobs, you know, uh, 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 uh. so so we're just the same as Wyoming, and just as Wyoming is hurting right now, so is the Wind River Reservation. But at here, I think on the reservation, I think we have more of an opportunity to look ahead and figure out how we dig ourselves out of this hole we're in right now. 
We can't continue to prop up coal and oil and gas to the detriment of our families and our communities. There's no, there, there's, there's no vision there. And as tried with our sovereignty and as Wind River, we're, as lucky, we're pretty lucky to be from here. You know, we have water and our water rights have been adjudicated, even though about two thirds of our water rights got stolen by the courts, two thirds of our surface water. And the courts also said we have no reserved right to groundwater, which is crazy, but that's the courts. And that's how we that's how they deal with tribes. And so this area of, 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 of water code development, when we had that team there, oh, and then we had the two attorney, two economists, and then we had a hydrologist. And this hydrologist we hired as our tribal water engineer. She had a bachelor's degree in geology. She had a master's degree in hydrology and she had a doctorate degree in watershed management. So she was just a, she finally connected me to the technical side of water rights. And then Dr. Getchus and Dr. Charles, they, they directed me to the, po the policy making, legal, technical, administrative components of putting a code together. That's where a lot of our tribes are lacking right now. We don't know how to exercise our governance. When you say you want a water code on one hand and you end up with a water code on the other hand, there's a lot of things that happen in between here. And most of us tribes, we can't, haven't quite figured that out yet. How do we breathe life into our treaties? What are my rights and responsibilities as a tribal leader, as a member of a council? And so that's where we really need support and help on that. And that's what I see as my role as the, in, in the GYC is to helping our people understand that, our families, our community. How do we make our government work for us? How do we strengthen our families and our communities with the resources we have, with the sovereignty that we have, and hopefully with the treaty that we have? Maybe someday we'll get somebody to honor those treaties. So hey, Wes. Talking, yeah. Um, thank you. Um, I, I want to allow some space for some questions, if that's okay. Um, we I've been receiving quite a few good ones in the chat. I, I'm going to open it up with the first one and, and um, open it up to all of you. And I'll start with Jason. You know, there's several um, traditional cultural properties in the Red Desert, like the Boar's Tusk and Steamboat Mountain, as well as others. Jason, uh, could you speak to the importance of Steamboat Mountain to the Eastern Shoshone people? If you're still on. <laughs> and I don't see Jason. So Wes, why don't you start with, um, with that question? You know, the, uh, one, one of the things I was uh, going to mention, too, is that, you know, on the environmental side, I mentioned our tribes have significant authority there to, to, to do things on the environmental. And most of that is held up by the United States Supreme Court. On the Antiquity side, we have the National Historic Preservation Act. We have the Antiquities Act. We have the uh, Archaeological Resource Protection Act. We have the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act, and we have the American Freedom of Religion Act. So there's five major federal laws that really support the importance of the indigenous areas out there that we want to protect. So, you know, the mountain that you mentioned, that Buffalo Jump that's in there, that's a very important sacred site for tribe. And, you know, rather than having people out there digging everything up and trying to send things to museums and other places, you know, our belief as indigenous people, just leave it alone. You know, there may be some things that are important to find out and study, but we don't need to dig up acres and acres of areas to, to do that. So, that, you know, these, these, important, these are important not only from our ancestral standpoint, but also from a protection standpoint and being able to utilize that in other areas. So, you know, you go out to the Red Desert, you know, a, a knowledgeable person, you don't go very far before you, you, before you keep hitting archeological and cultural resources and those need to be protected. 
Thank you, Wes. Jason, I saw that you just um, joined. Would you like to speak to the importance of Steamboat Mountain as a, a traditional cultural property to the Eastern Shoshone people? Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, I had to switch devices. Uh, Steamboat Mountain is an actual uh, buffalo jump. And it was very important for Shoshone people and uh, you know, there's there's evidence of uh, pit houses that are seven, eight, ten thousand years old that are not too far from Steamboat Mountain, and the people that would have uh, utilized that buffalo jump would have uh, been very patient. If if you look at the topography of that that uh, mountain, uh, it's the highest elevation mountain out there. Uh, it was strategic the way that the people would have moved those buffalo over that particular jump and would have harvested them for thousands of years. And that's um, hard to fathom. Uh, it's a very special place because of the, the camps, the, the spiritual nature of that place. Uh, and there's many places that are like that, but Steamboat Mountain being a buffalo jump itself, as well as a uh, uh, campsite and very important place for wildlife and migratory animals that move through that uh, place on their on their routes. Mule deer, elk, pronghorn, a very important habitat for many species. Sage, sage grouse. The Indian Gap Trail uh, runs right adjacent to that, which is thousands and thousands of years old, but it doesn't receive the type of uh, uh, buffer zones or protection that the Oregon Trail that gets, uh, which is young in comparison. So, you know, there's a discrepancy in the uh, acknowledgement of that history and that very, very old history that's tied to our people, to the, the people that I have behind me that uh, used that trail. And, uh, you know, the very important place the, the red desert in its entirety uh, but especially the northern red desert um, and deserves protection thank you jason and thank you wes i have a question um that's for yufna and someone is is wanting to know um if you know of any cultural significance of the boar's tusk to Arapaho people or other tribal nations? I think, um, so the boar's tusks, I have gone out there through tribal consultation when I was the Tipo and um, it was all tribal, it was the, all the tribes. And um, I think specifically to the Arapaho, um, it is a location that is um, of importance, but it's not as important as it is to the um, Eastern Shoshone, the Sh the U, the U Mountain, U, the Bannock. Um, and those sacred sites, um, of there, there needs to be a lot more regulation with forest tusk that I feel because um, there's not so much regulation when you talk about climbers, when you talk about util utilizing a sacred space. This, this location, the forest tusk is very important to these tribes. And um, basically when we go to church or we pray, we do go to these sites. So when you go and you desecrate or you climb or you're there using these sites in ways that tribal people were not used to, um, you know, it makes us feel really um, disrespected and disheartened knowing that people aren't taking that consideration into um, how those spaces are used. Um, just like Devil's Tower, um, that being that sacred space too, um, there were many times that these, these places with, like I saw in your, your chat that um, we need to start utilizing the indigenous names. We need to start using the um, first people locations. Um, I would not mind seeing a lot of these locations with Shoshone names in them written in their language. Um, so being able to promote those is, I, I believe this, this is that start. We need to start now and we need to really um, look forward to preserving those areas. Thanks for that, Yufna. And I understand there's um, probably only so much that you want to share publicly about some of these spaces because they are 
so special. And um, a lot of time when they are heavily trafficked, they run the risk of being um, damaged. So I appreciate that um, response. Jason or Wes, do you have anything to add as far as um, the importance of Boar's Tuss as a symbolic and cultural space for your people? You know, one of the things we're working on right now with the um, Greater Yellowstone Coalition is the anniversary of Yellowstone National Parks coming up on March 1st of next year. And according to park uh, staff, there's about 30 tribes that have been tentatively identified of having some ancestral affiliation with the park. And then we're talking with some of the tribes, um, you know, uh, these areas uh, and talking with the Shoshone Bannocks, they're already working with some of the federal agencies, Bridger Teton, Grand Teton, Yellowstone National Park on restoring some of their, their traditional names for areas and sites that in their homelands. And I think that has to happen for all tribes in, in, in all these public parks. And so, you know, there has to be history tone turned about that. So, you know, just uh, following up on, on youth now, I, I was really glad to have her when she mentioned wildlife quarters, because that's another important area. Why indigenous people moved and stayed where they did at certain times of the year because of that. And so there's just a lot of uh, conservation efforts that, you know, I say you can't talk to con you can't talk conservation without including indigenous voices. And so that's really an important part of, you know, just just like the way indigenous people burn the forest to 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 to, to, to regenerate them, to keep them alive. You know, you take care of us, we take care of you. That's that reciprocity that we're all missing. You know, Thank you. Takes care of us. It should take, and we should take care of the park. We have a couple more questions um, that have been um, coming in. Thanks, folks. Again, keep your questions um, in the chat box. Jason, here's one for you. Um, what is the potential for establishing a buffalo herd in the Red Desert? That's an interesting question. You know, the uh, potential is there. The habitat yeah, exists. Right the problem is people get in the way, and. Uh, you know, the public land bison restoration conversation has been pretty heavily debated in Montana where Gianforte, uh, heavily Republican conservative administration is uh, trying to squash any tribal restoration efforts to public lands. So, uh, you know, I think we have to begin to shift our way of management thinking towards ecological integrity. And, you know, we have federal agencies like the Bureau of Land Management that prioritizes oil and gas, agriculture, uh, and uh, grazing in, in, in high desert ecosystems. Uh, there's places where that is feasible, but, um, you know, the, if, if these public lands were prioritized for ecological integrity, we, we couldn't have that conversation without thinking about the keystone species. And uh, bison as a keystone species, we know uh, change uh, in our ecological drivers. They, they increase the plant and animal biodiversity. And uh, if you look on a, in a global scale, you know, the 80% uh, of, of, of the world's biodiversity exists on indigenously managed lands, even though indigenous people are 5% of the population. That's not a coincidence. If you manage the landscape holistically, uh, then that traditional ecological knowledge overlaps with our environmental science and ecological principles. If we restore the keystone species, we restore the landscape. And if we were to prioritize that, like we're trying to do with bison restoration here on Wind River, managed as wildlife on larger landscapes, then we will begin to see the benefits of that ecologically. Uh, there's also the social connection, the cultural connection for tribes and bison. But I, uh, I would anticipate that, you know, if, if we can get generate enough support, that there's no reason why buffalo cannot exist in the Red Desert. You're here. Thank you, Jason. I have another question. Um, and I'll, I'll pass this to Yufna, and then if Jason or Wes want to follow up, you can. So if there were to be some kind of federal designation or legislation for the Red Desert, 
the future of this landscape, um, say a national conservation area or something else, what's your perspective on tribal co-management um, as the example um, that occurred in Bears Ears? Um, so that's a good question. That's something I think about daily. Um, I think it's up to the tribes to decide. And something that Wes has talked about was that's, excise, that's really exercising our sovereignty. If tribes do want to co-manage these areas, I think it would be up to the tribe's leadership to decide to step in and say, yes, let's, let's help do this. Let's help do it in a way that is um, feasible, but let's also have the resources as funding to be able to do this in a way that is um, really good for the tribes. Um, I see that um, futuristically happening, but again, um, I, I wouldn't mind seeing what our tribal leadership on both sides um, think about that. Jason or Wes, do you have anything to add to um, this idea and intent of the tribes being co-managers of some of these public landscapes that are traditional lands? There's already some movement underway to allow tribes to start getting into co-management. Back in 2004, Congress adopted the Tribal Forest Protection Act which was an act allowed to, uh, uh, to permit tribes to enter into agreements with the Forest Service to start co-managing Forest Service lands that are adjacent to their reservations. You know, here at Wind River, we're, our Western boundary is the Shoshone National Forest. You know, we have hundreds of archeological sites in that forest. So we would really love the opportunity to be able to co-manage some of these areas. Um, under, you know, on Jason's presentation, he talked about the self-determination era. And in 1973, President Nixon signed uh, self-determination, Indian, Indian Education and Self-Determined Assistant Act that was allowed to, that allowed tribes to en enter into contract with the federal government on some of the Department of Interior functions. So a lot of the BIA programs are now contracted and run by tribes. So there's movements to do that. And, you know, part of our um, work with the Grady Yellowstone Coalition and the 30 tribes that we're, we're working with on the Yellowstone National Park anniversary, we also want to touch on some of the policy issues of the Park Service to start figuring out how we can have more voice. Thank you, Wes. Jason, do you have anything to add to that question? Uh, I think uh, Wes said it very well, as, and Yufna as well. I think that uh, it's about time, uh, and that's about all I have to say. I have a question from Ken who is asking what resources um, are available to the general public regarding indigenous people's place names and locations and plant resources for food and health as used in the past. Uh, the, the migration initiative map that was part of your presentation, Jason, Jason was excellent, but do any of the panelists have um, resources that they can share or direct um, the members on this uh, panel too. I was um, in contact with Greg Nickerson, uh, who was, you know, one of the leads on that Wyoming Migration Initiative. He kindly provided those maps to me, but he was very stingy with the copyright. So I would, I would encourage uh, you to e either purchase his publication or reach out to Greg to see if that might be available for you to share uh, for could be educational purposes and he would be supportive of that I would I would think. I just want to add really quick well sorry I, I, just really quick and then Wes can go um, there is this new um, thing a lot of tribes are jumping on and getting funding for and it's food sovereignty. A lot of them are um, organizing and they're getting together like Wes had, Jason had said that the Eastern Shoshone are coming together, they're organizing and they're putting together, um, you know, knowledge and putting all of those, that, those resources together. And I think a year from now, you're gonna see this huge rise in food sovereignty. 
You know, not just the other day, there was a big uh, controversy about the CNN. Uh, uh, I think it was Santorum, CNN uh, news guy that said, uh, you know, when uh, in from 1492, when America was discovered, there was nothing here. You know, and, and I seen Secretary Hall and her response to that was that, you know, that's really unfortunate that he talks like that. But she said another, another fact of this is that there's not much true history and documentation out there about na sovereign nations and what has happened to them over the decades. And so I think that's really an area that we we're, we're working on with Yellowstone National Park through the GYC is the history of the park has to be known. And those 30 tribes that are connected, they've, they've got a, each got a story to tell. And so that's why we're, we're, we're working on this anniversary to bring those stories out and you know, have more reliable sources of information because I see all the time of uh, people out there impersonating Indian people, you know, and claiming they have ancestry and they, they, they truly don't. And this is where the tribal historic preservation officers are so important too, to make sure that information and public relations and other things are, are uh, supported by the tribes. Thank you, Wes. There was a question earlier about uh, land acknowledgements um, being used in schools and this is um ironically a, a new um topic but do any of the panelists have opinions on on how um land and traditional land should be talked about in public schools or any advice for us I think this is why the uh, Indian Education for All bill was so important in creating more understanding about the tribes, not only the Shoshone and the Arapaho, but also the tribes adjacent to reservation like Black Hills, the Lakota, the Cheyenne, the Crow. And I think that because of the passage of that legislation in Wyoming, there is now resources available uh, online. There's uh, educational materials that are available and being and more being uh, produced, I think. So uh, I, I think if you dig into some of those archives that, that there'd be fine, you'll find uh, information that would be sufficient. But if not, uh, in, you know, I think that I would be available to help provide you with additional information if, if need be. Thank you, Jason. There are, there are some organizations that uh, their land acknowledgement consists, if you're having a meeting in Rapid City, South Dakota, you, I acknowledge I'm on the land of the Lakotans. Or if you're having a meeting in Lander, Wyoming, I acknowledge I'm on the land of the Eastern Shoshone. Or if you're having a, a meeting in Window Rock, Arizona, I acknowledge I'm on the land of the Navajo. I think that's another way to get more understanding of the history and where our public lands are right now. So I think that's a, that's, that's a good way to acknowledge the land, but Jason also made a good point. It's up to us as tribes to start getting true history and information out about our past. Yifna, do you have anything to add um, to that question about land acknowledgements in public schools? Yes, I think that it's a great idea for schools to be able to do that. Maybe even for their athletic departments who travel to various other schools so that they're learning the lands of indigenous people and they're understanding um, that uh, you know indigenous people moved around. The other thing to that is knowing that um, our reservation children, our, our own children here, assume we've always been here as the Arapaho. And they don't realize that there's other lands out there that we migrated and roamed. And so trying to learn that history, like Jason said, really uh, focusing on accurate history, focusing on what's important to teach our youth is really important along with our teachers. Um, I think that's something that I would wholeheartedly think that schools would, should, should be doing.
you know why you're um, st still on? I, I wanted to know if you would be open to sharing um, publicly some of the tours that you're doing and um, the one the one specifically in June that is open to membership on the Wind River Reservation. Yes. So as a Wind River organizer, I am arranging a tribal leadership tour in on June 19th. Um, we're meeting at Heinz and we're going out to the Red Desert. Um, the plan is to get tribal leaders, tribal members, if you're interested to come out, let, let Shalice know, get on the website, let us know you wanna go. Um, we'll meet at Heinz and we'll go out to the Red Desert. Um, the goal there is to talk about what tribes priorities are, what they feel like, how we should go forward. Um, I think that's gonna be really great. Um, we're also having other um, activities and other tours. I'm hoping to, at some point at the end of the year, get a mixture of tribal and non-tribal and kind of get various perspectives um, and, along with um, various other um, tours that we're doing at Wyoming Outdoor Council and Citizens of the Red Desert. I think it's, I think it's great. Um, there's so many things that are going on this summer. Check out the websites. Um, it's gonna be a pretty cool summer to go out to the Red Desert with us. You're on mute, at least. Thanks. Jason, I know you're involved in many things. Uh, is there anything coming up that's open to the public that you would like to share with folks? Oh, Shoshone Indian Days is scheduled for the third week of June, 25th, 26th, and 27th. So, you know, part of uh, bridging understanding is, is uh, to visit our social celebrations and events. So I would encourage folks to come to uh, that that powwow celebration, um, and and visit, interact, and see some of the the our community here. Um, also, I think um, the Buffalo program itself is uh, taking taking more form, uh, looking to develop a uh, a nonprofit around education. And so this will be a, a place where we can bring students and schools uh, to learn more about the cultural connection uh, and the ecological importance of, of bison or buffalo on the landscape and back here to our communities. And so that will be an avenue to, uh, to bridge more understanding and, um, and working together for uh, the, the benefit of healing our communities. Thank you, Jason. And Wes, do you have any last thoughts or tidbits to share with us before we close the program today? Well, I'd like, I'd like to re-emphasize uh, the Yellowstone National Park anniversary, 150th year that's coming up. We're trying to, you know, really encourage tribes to participate and help the park, you know, present a true history and story of, you know, there's some dark history to the park. And, you know, people, you know, when uh, President Roosevelt created the first national park, they forcibly removed indigenous people there from there to create that. And just like most national parks across the country, most of these parks are sacred sites to indigenous people. So we really want to use this anniversary as an opportunity to educate, to inform, and bring indigenous voices into conservation. Thank you. And thank you to all of the people that joined, especially our panelists, again, to the Wyoming Outdoor Council for hosting um, this event with us. We really appreciate um, your support. And uh, I wanna let everybody know that this has been recorded and we are gonna be sharing it publicly. It will likely be on YouTube and on our websites. And if you have further questions, I encourage you to reach out to Yufna, Wes, or Jason personally. Um, their emails will be also available, and I'm sure they'd be happy to talk more with any um, questions that you have. And thanks again. I, I just want to end it by saying that um, it's, it's really wonderful to hear this history that um, has been that has existed for so long and this is i know that we just skimmed the surface of it today so thank you again and i'm going to close with um 
words from my friend Angelo Baca, who says that the tribes have always been here. They are still here and they will always be here. So thank you again, and we'll see you out in the desert, hopefully.